I have uh, kind of worked quite a bit with JD. Um, I did work for a couple of years at Open Up. Uh, so we work very closely together. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Open Up. Um, if this is the first time you are hearing about them, definitely go check them out. Uh, so it's just openuponeword.org.za. Um, they do a lot of work at the kind of the intersection of uh, social good and technology and, and so forth. Um, yeah, and I, I know I know Skolt Mietlin quite a bit. Um, I don't think we've ever formally worked together on, on anything just yet, but like we, we do kind of move in the same type of spaces. So uh, we do kind of bump into one another quite a bit. Um, and as far as I understand, uh, tonight you're going to be talking about a progressive web app that you guys built. But specifically, a uh, progressive web app uh, within kind of like the, the public, um, I almost want to say public sector. So yeah. um, kind of your experience uh, using progressive web apps kind of uh, for um, service delivery and so forth. Um, I myself am super interested in, in hearing more about it. And um, but before we get into that, I, I just want to say uh, thanks to our sponsors, uh, which is... Um, uh, NML, uh, which is the organization that um, Justin works for, they have been with us since sure, several years now. And I think they've been with us since the start. Um, the very first uh, meetup was actually held at the NML offices. And, um, and then also, we also are super grateful for getting sponsorship from uh, IO Digital. Uh, they are an organization um, kind of working within the digital space uh, as well. Um, both uh, Justin and I are very good friends with Liesl as well, um, who kind of heads things up there. Um, they're also very involved in the community space and so forth. They also run something called Zapt, which is a South African product design, um, which is kind of like the sister workspace to uh, ZA Tech, but more focused on the product design side of things. Um, so yeah, I just want to make a point of just giving a shout out to both of them. Um, we wouldn't be able to do kind of what we're doing for as long without their support. But, you know, on that note, um, I'm happy to hand over to JD and Skulk, um, let them introduce themselves and maybe kind of introduce uh, what they're going to be talking a bit uh, about tonight. Thanks very much for inviting us. Um, I, I feel really privileged to, to be able to speak here. I think this community have some really amazing uh, talks going on and some really amazing support for, for especially um, new developers. Um, so I'm really excited to, to share what, uh, what we've done and what we've learned and uh, what we would now not suggest anyone else do from, from our experience. Um, there, there are a couple of those cases. To, tonight, we'll be talking about uh, an app we built for a municipality in the Western Cape, Cape Agulhas municip municipality. And OpenUp doesn't normally just build stuff on contract. We're not purely a, a tech shop. Um, I'll get into more of that um, on, on what sort of projects we take on and what this project was about. Um, but I'll hopefully be using this as, an, as, a, as a way to, to talk through a, a real use case of, of an app with some particular requirements. And we'll be, we'll be sharing our experiences and some of the, the decisions we regret and some of the decisions that, that um, made sense at the time, but that needed, needed changes as we learned more. Before we, we get into it, I'm JD. I'm the, um, the, the head of product that's opened up at the moment. Um, I was head of tech when we were uh, doing this. Uh, for my sins, um, they didn't really replace the previous uh, CTO when he left. So eventually it was just like on my head. Um, but no, it's a, it's a really fun organization. Um, I've learned more than I could ever imagine there. Uh, and um, yeah, on the product side, I get to, to give space to a, a more, more experienced CTO and um, make sure that what, what I've learned in applying my tech skills to um, making sure that, that South Africans are, are empowered to, to improve their lives, that that learning goes, goes into our products from, from the perspective of someone who understands product development and not just um, civil society, but sort of bring, bringing these two things together. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, that's me, uh, Skalk. 
Hey, um, yeah, my name's Skull Mietlin. Um, I run what you can call a consultancy called Mechanical Inc. Um, it's old, but also new at the same time. Um, I say that because for the longest time I had one really big client, which is Mozilla. Um, and only uh, over the last year and a half or so have I started branching out and um, looking at working with other companies that I feel I share a mission with. Like, as JD mentioned, um, what Open Up stands for and what Open Up tries to do, I, I share a lot of that. And I try to um, not just do work for work's sake, but do work that has meaning. Um, and so therefore I like to work with uh, businesses, companies that has a vision that I can believe in um, and that I feel good about. So that the work that I do um, has some meaningful impact on the world. Uh, small, big, doesn't matter. Um, um, my main focus is front end development. Um, I have some experience with back end. I mean, mostly using Node, but I have dabbled with Python and stuff like that. But I wouldn't advise anybody hiring me to do that. Um, but with front end stuff, that is my passion. Um, and when it comes to that, stuff like accessibility and performance is key for me. Um, I feel the web um, has the power to improve people's lives and allow people to um, make their lives easier. But if we don't take the time and effort to make sure that what, the things we build are accessible, we're actually losing all these people and that can benefit so greatly from, from accessible services. So anything I build, that's always on my mind. I, I will always push back on anything that somebody proposes that I know is gonna have an accessibility impact. And performance plays into that. Like it doesn't help. It's keyboard accessible and screen reader accessible, but it's as slow as a turtle. Um, that's not going to help anybody. So you know, all those things play together. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, the way I got involved in this project was actually funny. Um, JD posted a thing on Upwork, and I um, uh, did a proposal, and he was like, "Wait, <laughs> are you? Is this called you?" And I was like. Yeah, I was like, maybe we should not bother with Upwork and <laughs> just do it directly. So it was kind of strange how it happened, a uh, happy coincidence. And I think we had, a, we had a bunch of fun. We had a lot of challenges that we'll talk about today. Um, but we delivered a product that the client is happy with and that we feel um, is going to make uh, the community closer to their municipality and, and help improve uh, service delivery. And that makes me feel good. So yeah, that's me. Cool. Um, so just like one little um, uh, how we work thingy. Um, I think if I say something wrong, which is very likely to happen, feel free to correct me in the chat. Or um, or if it's very wrong, feel free to, to shout out or put your hand up. Um, I see Skulk nodding already. So I don't know what I've already gotten wrong. That's Skulk Fenter um then um but if also if you have a question it looks like um i think keep the sort of discussion stuff for the end but um because i'm I hopefully we'll have plenty of time hopefully we won't keep you busy for two full hours um but if there's something where you think we're we're sort of getting past a certain point and you you feel like you're you're just missing some understanding of something by all means shout out or something put your hand up and uh, and ask and we can clarify and if it goes into a big discussion we'll we'll push that to the end uh so yeah um anything else before we go on yeah so let me also just add to that yeah any any questions uh, generally we prefer if you just post them in the text chat um if it's a quick one to answer then jd or skulk will maybe just respond uh, otherwise most of the time other attendees actually are able to answer the question or po point you in the right direction okay and obviously you know these are things related to uh, the talk not like what what dinner should i make tonight or whatever <laughs> cool all right cool. go ahead jd so yeah let's let's do the next slide 
open ups vision like i said we're oh, i didn't say we're a non-profit um we're not your typical software house um and our vision is a south africa where where citizens and government are empowered to thrive collaboratively um collaboratively is a big thing for us uh we don't believe that government is going to solve everything uh, but i think they they play a role in or they need to play a role in making stuff happen someone has to organize stuff uh, most of us want to get on with our lives so that's kind of where i see see government's place um but we we believe that um that they're often at an information disadvantage or a, a, a skills disadvantage just like just like we are skulk is in a in a great place to to give us a little bit of a rant of, of the, the state of the browser world um and then i'll give a quick introduction to the app we built uh we built it for Cape Pergales municipality i'll talk about the context and what the the users wanted and then we'll go through some of the specific aspects of progressive web apps um while looking at the features we were Im implementing specifically in this app and i think there's a couple of pitfalls and and a couple of lines on on and um there's there's probably lots and lots and lots more to talk about so so do think about some specific things you want to want to discuss if we haven't touched on it there's a good chance we've at least thought about it and, and uh, even if we don't have have anything specific on it all righty so intro to pws oh focus um so so there's a lot of potential in progressive web apps but at the moment it's a bit of a mess and this is a lot of work still needed and and this is shared across the developer community as well as browser vendors um, and just general evangelism. So what is a PWA? It's essentially a website with superpowers um, that gets us closer to what native apps can do on mobile devices. But this is not just a mobile target. Uh, you can do this on desktop as well. But the problem is the ecosystem of PWA is, is a bit broken. Um, I'm referring to the user experience. Unless you do um, due diligence to tell a user kind of yourself, if, like browsers give you, um, will prompt users to install your app if it meets the criteria that means that this is a PWA. It's more obvious on mobile than it is on desktop, but there is a disconnect, I think, from a um, general user perspective, because they see an application as something you get from an app store or that you buy and install. And a website is something that you just look at in your browser. You type a URL and you go there. Um, so this whole idea of this thing you can install and there's an app, but it's a website, but it's an app, that's kind of weird. And so people don't understand exactly why do I want to install a website on my phone? I can just go there. Because um, they don't know the technical details. Uh, so that's where the evangelism part comes in. But that's also where how we surface the stuff to users comes in. Um, so I would personally not rely on just the mechanism that a browser by default will give you to prompt a user to install an app. I would go a little bit further and take over the experience a little bit in terms of prompting the user with a custom made call to action. Once the user reacts to that call to action, well, you're gonna hand over to, to the browser to do, to do its job, but you can probably do a bit more, a, a better job of engaging with your users to get that initial um, action to install your app. Um, the other thing is, other than I think Microsoft and maybe, I don't know, maybe um, the uh, Google Play Store, uh, PWAs and native apps don't live side by side. Like you have to go to the website to find the thing that you can then install. You can't open the Play Store and search for it um, and have your PWA listed alongside native applications. This means more often than not, you find companies that have to manage three, four code bases just because they are building a uh, wrapper in Kotlin or in Swift or in whatever, or Electron that essentially just embeds a web view and renders your website. 
But because they did that, they can publish it through the App Store and it's just like it's a native app suddenly. But you don't actually need to do that. There are some hoops and things you can jump through and tools and, and build tools and things that can take your PWA and make it be install, um, available in the app stores. But really, we shouldn't need to do that. Um, PWA should be a first class citizen just like any other app because it can do what any other app can do for the most part. Um, there's some limitations. Um, thing is, if the adoption remains as slow and low as it is at the moment, um, I don't know how many of you actually use progressive web apps on your phones or desktops on a daily basis, but as long as that is the case, um, especially browser vendors with small teams are not gonna invest time and energy in building in these features and supporting these features simply because there's more important things to do. I mean, Mozilla um, kind of recently ripped out all the PWA stuff essentially from Firefox desktop just because it, it's too much to maintain and not enough people install it. But that kind of sucks because now if you want somebody on desktop to install your app, they kind of have to use a Chromium based browser um, because Safari is a nightmare. <laughs> it doesn't support things, things it does support, it kind of supports, but not really. Um, and so I think there's a heck of a future for this. And I think this is a great thing for the web and unfortunately, I think one of the things that's unfortunate is PWAs were associated with Google for the longest time and that it was a Google thing. And it's not, it, it's, it's a collection of open standards that make up what a PWA is. And we need to, from a developer perspective, we need to talk about this more. We need to talk about what the potential is for this for users and for developers. But mainly, mainly for users. I mean, being able to have a single code base and have that run anywhere, everywhere, um, in the same manner that, that an application can, that is a big win for a developer. Um, for users, it's great to have an, an application experience because one of the reasons I think you would install something as an application as opposed to just using it in a browser, especially on desktop, you don't have, one, it's not one tab among a billion other tabs. It's focused. You have your Todoist app open. And so you're focusing on that. So it, it almost gives you this distraction-free experience. Whereas when you're in the browser, you're always other tabs um, claiming for your attention. So that's one of the like small benefits. Um, and then PWIs can do stuff like that uh, plain old websites can't do. We have push access, push notifications. We have offline access. We have application shortcuts, which is add to own screen, that kind of thing. We have the web share API that's come out now service workers, the one code, code base for all that I talked about. We have caching, you have, so caching is not just beneficial for offline access, it's beneficial for general performance. Like if you've cached a bunch of your assets on first load, the uh, experience for your users is just gonna be so much better. And, and it's gonna be closer to what people expect from a app, um, as opposed to a website where people expect, you know, things to sometimes be slow. Um, so, I mean, for me, there's always this phrase of there's an app for that and PWA should be included in that phrase. It shouldn't be an addendum or a thing that's on the side, but not really important. It should really be that's part. Of, when you say there's an app for that, PWAs are included in that. But I think we need to evangelize. We need to talk about this. We need to use these things ourselves. We need to build useful PWAs that people want to use so that we can send the signal to the browser vendors to say, hey, yes, this is something we want. This is something users want. So you now have a reason to really support and build this out and make sure that we have the same experience, no matter whether you're on iOS, Android, desktop, Firefox, Safari, Chrome, Brave, doesn't matter. We have a consistent experience and happy users. So that's my long introduction to PWA and my call to everybody to build PWAs, use PWAs, talk about PWAs and push browser vendors, go on their, their bug tracking systems and, and 
vote up anything that's related to PWAs that they have open and haven't finished yet and vote for, for these features to land. Because that's how we're going to get a, a, a better web for everybody. So, okay, so let, let's talk a little bit about the app. Just to, to take from, from what, uh, what Skulk said, I don't know if there's a standards-based way of saying whether something is a, a PWA or not, because it's, um, it's, a, um, it's a bunch of standards, really, that offer you a lot of the functionality that uh, native apps have, um, depending on platform and browser support. Um, so, um, and, and browser vendor in the Android space. So it's, it's um, a little bit of a rocky road to figure out what, what level of support you're going to find. And that's why it is progressive. Um, you, you kind of make available what's there. Um, and so, yeah, let's, let's talk about sort of how that, that manifested in, in what, what we built. Uh, next slide, please. So we built this uh, app for, for Cape Agulhas Municipality, and they also call it their community management app or uh, their My Muni app, uh, which I think is great because I think it's good when people see the municipality as belonging to them. Um, and uh, it kind of got named that way because Skulk decided to put the, the title My Muni on, on the second tab in the, in the app. Um, for them, it's very much supposed to be a communication mechanism, both a way for the, the municipality to inform the public of things that they need to know about, and also for the public to speak to the, the municipality and perhaps get some kind of feedback from them afterwards. Um, and you can see the, the link to, um, to the code in GitHub um, there. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on the, the front end, obviously, tonight. Um, the, the back end was just the same thing with back end in there. Um, and there's a lot we can we could have improved we could have made this a lot more of a sleep experience and stuff we've really had to kind of just scrape the barrel and get the the base functionality in place um so but i mean feel free to let us know if you do find things that could improve um but i i know the list is long uh next slide please so we at the beginning of the project we um <laughs> we it kicked off right sort of um mid lockdown at the um Early, early last year. Um, so we had to do user research remotely and we didn't want to just speak to um, the, the people who already have access to everything they need and the information they need and the, uh, the services they need. We wanted to speak to everyone. Um, and the municipality was great at facilitating that. And we, we, I think we did get a very good spread of, of people. But just some of the, the user stories that were really prioritized highly based on a, a range of the, uh, the, the users we interviewed was something like, I would like to know about disruptions so that I can make alternative arrangements. And that might be something like um, a, a road being closed if you're traveling to work or, a, um, or an electricity outage if you're running a BNB. It's a, it's a big holiday destination. Another one is I would like to easily report problems so that they can get fixed. Uh, I'd like to know what the municipality is doing, uh, what they are planning, so that I can tell whether they're listening. And I don't want to be transferred five times to speak to the right person. Um, I don't want to make five phone calls to get to, to someone who actually answers their phone. So that said, um, why are we building an app? Uh, are we actually serving a, a broad part of the community when we're building an app? Um, and open up, take on projects that we feel are going to um, move closer to our vision. And we did feel that it, it could help here um, because um, people were saying driving to, to sort something out face-to-face -face is tough. We're, we're not in a world where no one has or, or most people don't have access to a device or the internet. Everyone has access to a device or knows someone who has access to a device. Everyone has internet or knows someone who has internet or can go to somewhere with Wi-Fi sometimes. So it, it did make sense. It wasn't totally stupid to, to make an app, even though it's, it's very easy in our space where, where civil society are quick to say, but people don't have access to these things. It, there, there is actually a, a strong argument for making something like this and getting access to, to services and information uh, into more hands. So looking a little bit at the, the tech stack, um, we use Webflow, um, which is, I'll show you a screenshot in a moment. It's like a visual way of designing and, and build, actually building websites. Um, and that provides you basically HTML, CSS, jQuery, which it uses for interactions. Um, and that provided us the, the app shell and components. 
Um, we built custom routing and controllers, and that was one of the, the things I regret. Um, we used Workbox uh, to help with, with the, the caching. Um, we use Parcel Bundler, and then our backend is um, something called Wagtail CMS. It's like a Python Django based thing that gives you an API. Um, and uh, that means a lot of the content can be managed very easily by the municipality. And then it, it's just reflected in a page um, that's fetched dynamically in the app. So this is basically what Webflow looks like. Um, you've got a little preview of the, the app, uh, app shell there. And the tree structure on the left represents the DOM structure that you actually get in your... your um, if you're old enough to remember Dreamweaver, by the way, the output of Webflow is like a million times better than Dreamweaver. It's... Uh, about as good as what Skulkventer would write. Um, that, that's it. That's a joke. Uh, it's it's almost as good as what Skulk would write. I, I don't know whether that was a, whether you were saying it's really bad or it's really good. <laughs> no, no, that was a compliment to Webflow. Next slide. <laughs> um, and this is just a, a quick example of our our component library um, where we build out sort of components and variations of components. Um, and then we can, using JavaScript, we can pick up these components and clone them and temp template in data and things like that. Um, and the, the idea with this, this way of working, and I'm, I'm only, it's, this is irrelevant to, um, to the PWA discussion, really. I'm only mentioning, mentioning it because I'm sure everyone in the front end meetup group is always going, is that React? Is that Vue? Is that custom? Uh, is that web components now? See, so, yeah, I know the new, the new lingo. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm primarily a backend developer, but, but I, I know how to play in this space a little bit. But um, the idea here is to, we, we wanted to, in, in Open Up now, we were trying something where we wanted the designer to have as far reach into the actual construction of the, of the sites and the styling and the interactions and the responsiveness as you could possibly imagine. Um, this went really, really far. Uh, I think this, this, we've learned a lot, there's stuff to, um, to explore further, but um, um, we're also using React in, in, in a few projects. That's also working well. And it's really, ultimately, it's always about a way of communicating between the designer and the, um, and the, the developers and what's going to be the best approach for the scale of the project. The scale of the project, like our scale is, is usually very tiny compared to what industry would have. We never have five people, five developers working on one project. It's always like one person working 50% for a few weeks to maybe 100% for a few months. And so just a very quick screenshot of the custom router, you've got regexes and then you um, tell it which um, function to run to, um, to handle that, um, um, that view. And it, it gets some information like the, uh, the URL requested and then it makes, um, presentation, the data fetching and presentation decisions based on that. Really, the point here is it doesn't matter. You can write, you can make a PWA from uh, HTML and CSS and JavaScript that you write all by hand. You can um, export something out of whatever. You can, you can probably make a web page in Microsoft Word, save it as HTML, stick in a, a couple of lines of, of script tags, and, and off you go. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, you can use React, you can use um, all of those things. Um, the important thing is that it, um, it tells the browser where to find the service worker, and then your JavaScript uses the right APIs. So our PWA stack then, from this uh, collection of, um, of APIs, uh, the main things we, we ended up using was add to home screen, uh, which isn't really directly an API, but it's a, it's a part of the specification. Um, web push uh, to remotely tell the app to do something. Notifications to show the user a pop-up. And I'll talk about that those things are, are different things. We often talk about push notifications, but it's useful to, to know that they're separate. Um, and then service worker um, for, for a, and, and the, the cache functionality for offline access. So why did we build an app? Um, Number one, the client wants an app. People are expecting an app. Um, users want an app. Um, and for us, we want to see engagement and participation. So you kind of use what you're given. Um, and that was our, our way in to, to see a very um, uh, civic action kind of angle on, on an app so that it isn't just another app, but 
hopefully we can make sure that that uh, public participation is, is a core element of that. And luckily, the municipality was very receptive to that. Um, and progressive web apps uh, supported much of what we, we needed. We have experience in building web stuff. We didn't have experience building PWA stuff at that point, but uh, we definitely didn't really didn't have experience of building uh, native apps. Um, so, so PWA seemed like a, a good time. I think last year was a good time to, um, to start going. It's not super, 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 super new. It's, it's stuff that has bit decent support now on, on a lot of handsets that are being used. And for things where like um, iPhones don't support notifications, um, well, it doesn't support web push, uh, I think if I remember correctly. Um, but there's fallbacks anyway, like SMS and email. Um, and another thing that we had in mind was that we were hoping to replace the website because a lot of the functionality we were talking about and information and so on was also being talked about being built for the website. And that would be really tragic to build all of this stuff twice. So um, we're not there yet, but, um, but I, I think it's, it's something that could happen in the future. So there's two kinds of installation happening here. There's when the, the service worker installs itself. And that is a whole thing. I'm going to talk about that right after we're talking about installation in the sense that users expect um, and adding to the home screen. Um, and the order might be not, not ideal, but, but I think we're going to figure it all out together at the end. Um, so yeah, installation. Uh, next slide. Uh, installation in from a user's perspective of a PWA, unless you've... Um, used one of the, the tools you can use to, to get it into an, an app store. Um, you're prompted a little, um, um, do you want to add this to your home screen? Um, little pop-up, you can customize what that looks like. Uh, I think that's the, the default one. Um, and then once you tap that, the browser asks you if, you if you really want to do that. And once you do that, it, some stuff happens in the background and you end up with the, the app on your, um, on your home screen, whatever that means. It, on one of my phones that uh, is like in the proper menu, on another phone, it's like more on the, on the homepage kind of thing, but on three pages on, it's a bit of a mess, um, but, but it kind of works. And then sometimes it doesn't work. So, um, but you can still from the browser menu say add to home screen. Um, and oh, my computer just locked. Let's see if I can unlock. I forgot to include a, a screenshot of what it looks like when you actually open it from, from the, the app menu. So when you, when you open it from, from there, um, it's, uh, the, you don't see the, um, any of the browser Chrome anymore. You don't see the, the address bar or the menu. It just looks like an app, especially if you set the, the colors and stuff, um, then uh, it, it really looks like an app and it's really slick and nice. Um, until you have a, uh, a 404 or something like that. I, I, I mentioned before, there's um, not really a concept of, um, well, I don't know exactly what the, the standards-based concept of what a progressive web app is. Um, I think, I don't know if Google make it, but there's, there's this project called Lighthouse that uh, makes it really easy to evaluate a whole bunch of things. Um, and it has a section specifically evaluating um, progressive web app functionality. Um, and this was a, a really nice way of um, uh, checking whether the app is still allowed to um, be installed and if users will still be prompted to install. And because this is this like very concept of um, you have to check a whole range of boxes. You have to have thumbnails that are the right sizes and in, configured in a manifest file and you have to have um, the, the start URL and you have to have this and you have to have that. And, you know, it, it became this, this kind of thing that we would every now and then accidentally break without realizing because we're just testing it in our, our dev browsers most of the time. So you deploy this thing to, to production and then it, someone would say, it's not installing, or it's not prompting to install. Then you have to go, did you, um, do you already have it installed? You have to go through the whole motion. And actually they've got a really nice way of, um, this configuration shows um, we've told it if the PWA category fails, um, if it's not 100% a valid PWA, um, and one of the items on being a PWA is that it's installable. So if it's not 100% valid PWA, then it's an error. 
So that's going to fail CI. That's going to fail our automated tests, and we're going to notice, and we're not going to deploy it. Um, we've turned off HTTPS stuff. We're just trusting that that uh, it's going to be HTTPS in production, um, and we're not so strict about all the other stuff. Um, I know we can improve our file sizes and all of that stuff, but it's anyway. This was a really nice way to to test just that aspect. There wasn't like a a perfect um, unit test, but we could tell quite easily that it that it um, is going to prompt to install on on uh, new users' phones. Except when it didn't. So I think there was a time when uh, Chrome had updated on on my phone at least, but it um, hadn't updated on uh, the CI machine. And I think some of the rules had changed slightly. So now it needed something different, different files, different um, dimensions were, were the required dimensions in the manifest. So CI was still saying it's going to be good, but it didn't install on, on my phone. So it's, it's not perfect. I don't know. It could have been a mistake. Just be aware. Um, it is finicky, but there, there is tooling um, and everything is testable. Everything in the world is testable. So don't say it's not testable. There, there is a way. So that then with all of this said and done, there's iOS um, and we were launched a couple of weeks ago and um, we get this email saying from an iPhone, I don't know, it's not prompting me to install. So I haven't debugged it yet. I think on Safari, it should work. Uh, so we need to figure out why, um, except if people are using Chrome on, on iPhones, uh, that's not gonna work. Um, because that's actually running Safari, I think, um, just like most other people run Chrome. Um, yeah, um, yeah. That that's why I mentioned in my introductory thing why it's a good idea to build your own prompt, essentially, um, your own call to action to install the app. Um, I'll share a video uh, of somebody from Chrome that the Chrome team that really talks through it really well and shows some really good code examples um, of how, how you can do that. It, it kind of avoids this problem. How do people find the app before they can install it? They need to find it. Here's the um, examples of like, yeah, you can put it into app stores, but you know, this is a web thing, right? It's um, supposed to be discover discoverable via the web. That's a really, I mean, that's, that's a really massive source of traffic for, for us because generally we're addressing things that people actually search for um, when, they, when they're looking for help. Uh, next slide. Uh, it's supposed to be accessible via Google, right? Um, and I checked last night and my heart sank and I couldn't, and I, I saw we're not indexed by Google and it's, it's a tragedy. Like we've done all of this work and it's, it's why? Um, I quickly put it on uh, Google Search Console. So could you just do next slide? Um, and after a few hours on Search Console, I could see why. Because we have a no index meter tag in there, because we were trying to hide the, the staging and the sandbox um, sites from Google. And then, um, yeah, uh, someone made a mistake and uh, production was also hidden from Google. So we need to fix that and then uh, it should be discoverable via Google. So installation of the the service worker uh which a lot of the other things build on um that happens in the background when you're visiting this thing so um yeah any so, sorry Scott, anything else on on add to home screen i'm gonna be talking about um installing updates here as well um obviously the first time you visit it it installs um and by default installing updates uh, of the service worker it happens transparently in the background. Um, but it can be a little bit tricky. Um, it's updated uh, when the PWA is, um, well, the PWA is updated the next time you load after all of your tabs have been closed. So if you have a straight tab open for the thing, then you might be stuck with it for a while. Um, I might be wrong, but this is how I understood what I was reading. And that sounded scary to me when you're trying to do tech support through a municipality doing. Cool. Luckily, that wasn't too, too long. The point I wanted to start making there is 
there's this page linked on the previous uh, page, well, but if you Google so, uh, service worker lifecycle, it's a long page, read it, read it again, go and play with some service worker stuff and then go and read it again. It's, it's really helpful to start understanding the life cycle of a service worker. Um, and on the next, let's, let's do the next slide. The service worker isn't actually that big a deal. That code on the left is a valid service worker. Um, it, it's a little bit of JavaScript. Your index.html uh, tells the browser, there's a service worker JavaScript file over there. Your browser goes there uh, it, and all this particular service worker says is it waits for the install event. And when that happens, it logs to the console that it's installing um, and then it puts something into a cache. Uh, it would have been a valid service worker, I think, if it didn't put anything into the cache as well. But what's the point of a service worker if it doesn't cache and it doesn't use any of the other service worker APIs? Um, and this little diagram, uh, we don't have to go into too much detail, but um, this is a, a great one from one of the, the blog posts on service worker life cycles. Um, when you visit the page and the browser sees there's a service worker that it hasn't um, installed yet, goes into the installing state. If everything goes well, then it goes into the activated state. But if there's already one running, it might um, wait before it activates, something like that. This is where I'm, I'm, it, it's worth being precise and I don't know all the, the precise details, but anyway. Um, and when you open the, the page again, then it'll, it'll activate again as well. And it can also activate for, for other reasons. Um, and I think that's what the, the idle and terminated and so on means. So just to take you through uh, a bit of what it takes to um, prompt the user to update. That's only going to happen, by the way. We, you could also send push messages to trigger this, but um, we were happy with the app updating when someone opens the, um, the app. Um, and at that point, it checks if there's an update. And if you have internet connection and it finds an update, then it will start loading the stuff in the background. Meanwhile, you can use the app. Now, you don't want to interrupt someone um, while they're busy submitting some information to the municipality. So you want to give them control of whether you're going to upgrade now or not. Um, like I said, I wanted to make sure that we're able to upgrade people's apps if there was uh, a reason for support, for example, if we can make something easier to use, um, or if we make some kind of mistake and there's a there's a bug or something, I didn't want broken a broken app to get stuck on people's phones and they aren't really able to navigate to a place where it's still running and stuck or something like that. Um, so I've drew two kind of threads here, um, the one being the client and the one being the service worker. Um, there's code for this on this, this link at the bottom, um, and you'll find a bunch of examples of, of doing that. And it might not be the best practice. I'm just saying why I did it. To, um, and some people do it, and some people don't. I think some native Chrome apps do it as well. Um, the important thing is really that you, you give people the option um, when they want to kind of trigger this upgrade. Otherwise, the upgrade happens in the background and they'll see the update next time they, they visit the site, not the time when it actually did the update. So your client loads, that's the stuff you see, um, and it listens for the waiting event. That's part of the, the service worker uh, lifecycle events. Um, if, it was, um, if there was an update to the service worker that had been loading in the background, your client would then receive the waiting event. You can then offer the client that, uh, the option to upgrade, um, and at that point, you start listening for the controlling event because you want there's, there's two threads to the, to the app. Um, there's the, 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 the client, the, the stuff you see, and then there's the service worker. Um, and you can't do calls directly from the one to the other. You basically have to send a message um, or wait for a browser event that tells you about what's happening to the, to the other one uh, or to the service worker. So you listen for the controlling event because that's going to tell this client the new service worker is now running. Then you send skip waiting, which is just a standard string that, that people use for this, to the service worker as a message. 
the service worker um, was waiting for messages and receives that skip waiting message. And then it calls self.skip waiting. And that's how the service worker says to the, the browser, um, I don't want to wait until next time. Kick me off, load the new one. It disappears um, and the new one kicks in. Uh, when the new one kicks in, that little circle above listen for messages, um, the, um, the client um, receives the, the controlling event and it goes, oh, there's a new service worker. At that point, there's a new service worker running, but you've still got the old client and you don't want to be running stuff, running code that might be incompatible with that service worker. So you do a window.reload. And at that point, it's going to uh, reload the page, fetch the new uh, JavaScript for your, your app. And um, ideally, that's JavaScript that's um, you've configured your caches in your service worker in such a way that you're definitely getting the up-to-date JavaScript. Um, and that's how you, trust me, this is the easy one. Looking at the, the code to do this and following the code, that's hairy. Um, so you might not want to do this. So that was like helping users install and upgrade the, the app. Um, when you're developing, just open your dev tools and there's really nice support for um, quickly reloading stuff. You don't have to do horrible hacks in your production code. Just, just use these tools. Um, and Firefox has some, I think the, the Chrome ones are better. Um, Yes, I would definitely, if you're doing PWA, kind of stick with Chrome, the Chromium based browser. For the, for the dev tools, um, um, I've yes, been doing a lot of the, yeah. Skalk, is that the official position of Mozilla? <laughs> <laughs> He's a contractor. Uh, acknowledge nor deny. <laughs> a notification, and, and this is what's important in our context where we need, needed to have the, the site administrators understand the, the concepts and stuff. The notification is the thing that pops up when you're not inside your browser um, or when you are or when you, regardless of whether you're in your browser. And it can show a bunch of stuff. It can show a little title, a little description. They're just as long. So don't think your description is gonna contain an essay. You can actually expand them, I think, but de depending on the device again, and depending on the operating system and the size of the screen and all of that stuff, you can show icons, you can show photos, uh, you can show a number of action, different actions people can take. Again, depending on the device. So any fancy stuff you do here with your notification, you're gonna have to think about fallbacks for the people who don't have the massive device with all of the capabilities, um, which for us meant just get it working, just get it out there, just get people using this so that we can get user feedback. Um, and hopefully we can then improve on it later. The thing on the right-hand side is a notice. That's just a web page. It's just a page in the app. Um, so you can execute any JavaScript when um, someone um, clicks the, the notification. Uh, the JavaScript we put in there was, would take, um, um, would, would open, open a, a link. Uh, and where that link comes from, I'll show you in a sec. So the web push API, um, the app subscribes to, push to, the, to a push service. That could be any push service. Um, part of the subscription process is backed by your, your browser vendor. Uh, we'll touch a bit on that in a moment. And then, but basically your, your app subscribes to the push service and the backend sends whatever you decide via the push service to the app. The notification API, a user has to allow notifications and then the app shows a, a message by the user allows notifications and then the app can show a notification even when the browser isn't being used. Um, the app can also show, um, basically whenever the app can execute JavaScript, if there's a valid subscription or sorry, if there's a valid notification permission, you can show that notification. notification. So when we combine that so that someone can send a message to the, the app, and you've written JavaScript that says, when I get a message that looks like this, I want to show a notification, then you've got push notifications. But you can also use the push API to send um, 
updated data so that the user doesn't even have to do a request um, when they want to see the, the latest weather or whatever next time. Um, in the same way, you can put a, a timer on or something and say um, in three hours, or I, I don't know exactly how the, the, the background timing stuff work in browsers, but um, later on, pop up a notification. Or when the user taps here, pop up a notification. Uh, that's just local JavaScript. Using an existing service for notifications is awesome in comparison to rolling it your, but yourself. I'll show you in a moment. Um, you basically import a script inside your service worker. Um, and then you uh, put some JavaScript that they give you into your, your, your page, your site. And then you instantiate it. Um, and you can use their widget. And usually, you can customize it as well. Uh, we particularly use um, a site called Pushpad. Um, they didn't believe me when I said the XYZ top level domain doesn't bode a lot of confidence, but um, uh, <laughs> that, that's how it is. Um, the, the way we chose Pushpad was some of the providers I saw were, were really expensive for their base level. And we're talking about a municipality, and th this is something that I think is worth you guys thinking about. Our biggest user base potentially is 30,000 people. In the 2016 um, population survey, they estimated 30,000 people in this municipality. And they, there'll be some tourists and stuff, but you know it's not going to be much more than that. So that's how many people there are. Now, if you imagine what fraction will subscribe, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's, it's not going to be a ton of people. So a $100 a month subscription feels really stupid for me. Um, some of the cheaper ones are super dodgy. And the Twilio or one of, one of the biggest ones basically said, since GDPR, we won't use your data for advertising on other websites if you live in Europe. Otherwise, either way, they're super easy and they basically all work the same. Um, and you can customize what it looks like as well. So it's, it's really nice. Uh, next slide. Initially, I wanted to understand how it works. And I was nervous about committing to a push service provider. Um, in hindsight, I think it's so easy that I should have just tried them and, and figured it out. But I was nervous about sort of, how do I know that things are, are being delivered? How do I know what I don't know? So I did want to understand how the system works. And I literally had to draw this diagram and it could be a lot better, but basically I, it, it's helpful. I'm going to go through this with you guys because it's, it's fun. And I think um, there's, there, there is interesting stuff there and it tells it gives you an impression of the capabilities, but, and also all the different actors. So the user is the user, obviously the app client is what we were talking about earlier, the stuff you see, the browser is where your code is running. The service worker is like the app client, but it's your code that have, that runs sort of in the background asynchronously from your uh, the user actually clicking around and, and, and stuff. Then the um, the push service is uh, the backend server you write or the um, pushpad or Twilio or whatever, and then the admin admin is the administrator who wants to send a message. So to be able to send a push notification to someone. The app client needs to get a registration object from the browser and then send that to the push service. Boom, done. Push service stores it somewhere. At some point in the future, um, that's something that the push service will use to communicate to your device via the browser vendor. They've got APIs for that stuff. So the, your, your phone is basically always checking that API, um, the, your browser vendor's notification API. Then separately from that, you offer the user the ability to have notifications. Uh, you probably only want to do that once, you've, once you're certain that you've actually got a, a, um, a push subscription. And um, you probably also only want to do that on an interaction, like when the user, so you can offer the user uh, notifications as some custom button saying, do you want notifications? When they tap that, only at that point should your client um, your, your site request that permission from the browser because browsers have realized that people are getting really annoyed with 
notifications being fired at people all the time without them actually opting into that. Um, so unless you have really good um, stats from, from visitors, engagement stats from visitors, um, you don't want to do that because it's going to hurt you. At that point, you once so, so once the user has opted in via your GUI, then you request that permission from the browser. The browser will then ask them to confirm. And if the user then confirms, now you've got a, uh, a notification uh, permission and now you can, and you can test for that later to see if the user has removed that. But now you actually have the permission to, um, to show notifications. At that point, after that point, if an administrator sends a notification message via the push service, and that push service sends that to all of the active subscriptions, that will go to the service worker, and the service worker will tell the browser to show a notification. Uh, that is what goes into showing a push notification. Uh, and that, that, that information that goes to your service worker and is, is whatever you want it to be. And it's the JavaScript in your service worker that decides if you're gonna show a notification and what, so that data structure is totally up to you. Or if you're using a, a third party subscriber, um, it depends really on whether uh, they allow you to send arbitrary stuff or whether you have to send it in their structure and then have to handle their structure. Uh, next slide. This isn't the end of it. So subscriptions can expire on your phone. I learned that after we built the, the subscription backend, I wouldn't have done the backend if I realized that. Um, and there's an event that fires in a browser. So you have to hope that the browser is actually going to activate and receive and handle that before you want the next subscription to arrive, um, then your service worker can go and get a new service. Um, I can, can receive that event, create a new registration object and update that one. And that gets a bit complicated when you want to have identifiers for your users in your push service so that you can target specific users and say, you have received this information because that push service will need to connect to your backend or you need to tell the push service, send a message to the user with this ID. And you don't want random users to be able to tell the push service, hey, I am user one, two, three. So that's where things get a bit hairy and I haven't gone down that route yet, but uh, we're gonna have to, to look at that at some point. So that's, um, yeah, that's a lot of information. I'm gonna hand you over back to Skalk now. Yetling, we're not done yet. <laughs> Thanks, Betty. Um, offline access. So it's one of the core things of, uh, of PWA. And it's one of the things that, uh, especially for, I think, PWA in general, but for this app, it's, it's really important. Um, so when I started on the project, um, JD already made the call to use Workbox, which is an open source project from uh, Google that powerful and um, pretty easy to use. The documentation is not as good as it can be. Um, you do have to experiment somewhat um, and fail and try again and fail and try again, but it's powerful and it abstracts a lot of stuff for you. And um, it handles some, like I said, some of the things with regards to PWAs is a little inconsistent across devices, and browsers, and platforms. So Workbox, kind of takes care of some of that for you. Um, we're using work, Workbox basically for caching. Um, and so there's two types of caching that we're using, pre-cache and runtime cache. Now, pre-cache is basically the core assets that you need to load something useful the first time somebody opens the app. Um, and these are especially stuff like static assets, like images, JavaScript files, CSS, HTML, all that kind of stuff. So um, eventually we, we, we landed on using the Workbox Inject. Uh, it's basically a script that you can configure with um, inside your NPM, inside package.json as an NPM script, and you call Workbox Inject, and it'll look for a file called workboxconfig.js. And in there, you have many options. The ones we, we use is we give it a directory uh, to look at. We tell it 
a bunch of uh, files that we wanted to uh, match. We tell it where the source uh, service worker is and where the destination service worker is. Now, Workbox does have the ability to completely generate a service worker for you, with you without you having to write anything. But there's some things, as you'll see in a minute, that we wanted to do um, over and above what uh, Workbox gives you. So we didn't want to cede total control to Workbox. So we chose an intermediary, which is Workbox Inject, which basically just takes care of pre-caching. So what it'll do when you run that, that script is it'll look in the disk folder for any files that matches uh, any of those extensions, CSS, HTML, blah, blah, blah. And inside your service worker, you'll initially have what's at the top here, the workbox pre-caching, pre-cache and route. And this is the critical part, self dot underscore underscore w underscore manifest. When uh, it finds all those files, it'll go ahead and in the service worker that it then writes to your disk um, folder, it'll go and replace that with an array of the files that it's found. And it'll add a revision. Now that revision is how it keeps track of this version of the JPEG image or the JavaScript or the ping or the whatever. So whenever you rebuild, if nothing has changed, those revision numbers will stay the same. If one or two or three of them is changed, their revision numbers will change. And so once the service worker loads up and it wants to pre-cache, it'll basically check, has any of the things changed? If they have, only replace them. If nothing's changed, leave it as is, we're done. Um, so you can basically, with a bold process, stick a bunch of your static assets that you want pre-cached into a folder and then just point, uh, instead of having to like hard code this array, just point uh, your configuration file to the disk the, the folder where all your assets is in and then workbox will take care of the rest. And once the server worker uh, starts up, it'll pre-cache this and it'll stick it in the pre-cache inside your caches, it creates two caches. One is the pre-cache, one is the runtime cache. Now, what about third-party caches? This is something we ran into. Our app shell would load, but a bunch of the icons and stuff wouldn't load, and some stuff would just be weird, like some of the functions wouldn't work and we couldn't quite understand. And that is because you can't handle the third-party assets that you actually need on startup via the inject. For this, you need to use uh, the register route function. But it's as you can see, it's super simple. You literally just specify uh, a bunch of origins and it'll, once your HTML file loads and it requests any of these, it'll handle it and stick it in, in cache. Um, the important one also to do is the stories for Google APIs one, because that's where we're loading Workbox from. So if that, wasn't available, then nothing will work. Uh, the other thing that you will notice here that's important is that we're using two different strategies. For the Workbox one, we're using a cache first strategy. And for the other ones where we're loading like uh, the font awesome icons and uh, jQuery and um, some fonts, we use stale while revalidate. The difference being for the Workbox one we're loading, we are pinning it to a specific version. And therefore we know that the likelihood of that changing after the first time the browser is requested and cached this is highly unlikely. Like, un so unless we re um, load a new version of Workbox, in which case we will bump the version of the actual service worker, you can probably just cache, load whatever you have in cache. With these others, something might change. Like, um, Font also might release a new update to the one because we're not loading a version specific one. So basically what stale while revalidate will do is it'll check with the network first if there's an internet connection. If the version that it has is the latest version. If it is, it'll just serve it from cache. If it's not, it'll grab the new version from the internet, stick it in cache and then serve it. So stale while revalidate is good for things that might change infrequently, but they might change and you're okay with that. 
you're okay with with them changing. It's not going to like break your app. You don't want to like for jQuery, for example, if you've pinned that to a specific, you might want to bump that out of this and also use the cache first strategy. So it doesn't grab a new version of jQuery every time and something breaks because the API is changed. So choosing your um, caching strategy here is key and it's something to um, think about. Um, the link at the bottom talks about all the different uh, options you have. You have network first, which is first try the network and only if that fails, try cache. Um, so we decided to stick with those, those two. Uh -huh. Runtime cache. Now, the runtime cache is important for us. Uh, and Workbox takes care of some of that by registering a route. You can tell it that whenever something matches this route, use this cache strategy to cache this. But you have to hit that route before it caches it. It doesn't do it um, while the user has just have the app open or are you looking at different pages. For us, there are certain core pages that we want to, as soon as we can, download and cache so that should the user lose their internet connection, they can still get to these core pages without having to have navigated to them. So for that, we needed some custom code. And this again goes back to what I talked about, why we decided to use Workbox Inject instead of just completely generating a service worker with Workbox, because we needed some custom code. Um, so what do we need to do? The first thing we needed to do is we needed to make a call to um, our API to get a list of all the service pages. So get services just gets all the services from the backend. Uh, what that gives us is basically uh, an array of um, a JSON, JSON with a bunch of um, entries for all the service pages. Once we have that, we can call um, cache service pages. And this is called, this is still a work in progress, um, but for now, what this does is every time the service worker loads, it'll call cache serv services pages. It's going to go and create a array of uh, the services, and it's going to, from that, grab the detail URL, which is the API call, and it's going to get the slug of the page that you would access that would normally make the API call. So once we have that, see what doesn't work. Um, we then have configured a specific name for our runtime cache, but we can easily get access to, to that via workbox.core.cachenames.runtime. That returns the name of the runtime cache, which we need to open the cache. So that's done by caches.open, give the name, and it gives you back the actual cache that you can now write to. For each of the, the URLs that we've gotten, we make a fetch call first to the, the backend API. If the response was successful, we stick it into the cache, and then we move on. We make a call to the actual, um, sorry, we first do an HTML the HTML page, so the what the user would access, stick that in cache. Then we make a call to the API, stick the response of that into the cache, and then just log out that we successfully fetched them cache. Now, once we've gone through all of them, all the services pages, the HTML as well as the JSON response you normally get from the API is cached in the runtime cache. Now you would not do it exactly this way. The reason being, um, say for example, you have a hundred pages. The minute somebody opens the, the app, the service work is gonna start up and it's gonna immediately start doing a hundred fetch requests. You don't wanna do that. So what we basically need to do, um, and what I, I have a, a open source repo that I also provide a link to that, that has the code for this. It's called Simple Service Worker on GitHub. Um, what we want to do is before we even start trying to do this background cache, we wait for about five seconds just to give the initial page load and pre-caching a bit of time to do its thing. And then between each fetch call uh, for each service, we'll again wait about five seconds or 10 seconds or whatever the case may be. Maybe five seconds is long enough. So we won't just go crazy. The other thing we'll do 
is we'll also first see, is this item already in cash? Because if it is, don't do the fetch request, just leave as is and move on to the next thing. Uh, the, but, but there is a scenario in which you would want to say, we've actually released a new version of this app. So really we want to force reload the cache entirely. And in that case, you also want to clean up after yourself. Because if you just, um, with the name that we basically create, it is a, a concatenation of my Muni, runtime cache, and the version of the service worker. So if you bump the version and you don't clean up after yourself, you'll end up just creating more and more and more and more caches. Um, and so that fills up the user's, the user's device or um, laptop or whatever the case may be. So it's a good idea to use something that you can use in a regex to say, hey, look for all caches that matches this name, but where the string at the end is different. So it's not V2, it's V1, whatever. Blow that away, create the new cache, and let's just go and do that. And basically you'll pause. So currently this function cache services pages doesn't take an argument, but you could pass it an argument called force reload. And you can check for that and say, if force reload is true, okay, let's clean up and we're gonna create a new cache and we're gonna actually do all the fetch requests again, waiting five seconds between each one. And we're not gonna bother to check whether this is in cache, we want the new stuff because maybe something in the JSON has changed significantly enough that our front-end code's gonna break if we don't have the latest API responses. Um, so that's a bunch of stuff to keep in mind uh, when you do this kind of thing. And this is stuff that we have to write ourselves. I, I couldn't find a, um, a way of Workbox giving you this. So this is something we had to manage. Um, once that all works, you now have an offline experience. Um, and I have a little short video here that I'm gonna show uh, in Firefox where um, I've just, I'm just gonna uh, load up the app for the first time. It's gonna install the service worker. And then it'll show that it's like, in this case, just gone and done all the features and cached it, go offline and then navigate to pages I haven't navigated to before and you'll see that it, it still works. So a service worker is running. And here I'm gonna find uh, the actual service worker. And then I can go and inspect it. Here you can see is all those console logs that shows that all those pages have been fetched and the API and the pages has been cached. And then now I'm switching to offline and I've not navigated to any, any service page so far. So now when I click, it instantly loads, go back, a lot of different servers and completely offline and everything works as if I had an internet connection. So it's not super complicated. And once you have this boilerplate, it's kind of just reusable in future projects. Um, I think this has improved the app experience. We still have quite a bit of work to do here. Um, like I said, there's some cleanup that we need to do after ourselves, some wake we have to do between fetches. And we need to, um, there's more than just the services pages that we'd like to initially cache. But this is a good step forward in giving the users a better experience if they lose their connection. Cool, yeah, I think the, the, the main thing I would add to, to what you said or to, um, to rehash what you said, uh, the important thing is that there's caching the static stuff, caching your app shell and, and stuff like that. And there's caching your runtime data. Um, and you can, there's beautiful automation for caching your static stuff. Your runtime data is always going to be very specific to your application. Is that one request or is it 500 requests? Is it a, a REST API? Is it like, it's totally up to you, which is great. The, pity, the, the, the unfortunate thing is no one can automate all of that away for you. There's, there's great, great helpers, but you ultimately have to decide what API requests do you need to do to store the stuff that you want? And what do you want to do to surface the information to your user about what has been stored offline and what isn't? 
they might want to stay offline, um, stay online. Like we've got people outside the, the Nando's down the road that are standing outside and using the Wi-Fi that, because that's their Wi-Fi access and there's clinics and things where it's the same story. So people are very aware of like when they have internet access and when they don't, which means they really need to know is, is this stuff offline? Can they go home now? Um, so, um, but, but that's going to be application specific. It's not something that someone can, uh, can just solve for you like the, um, the, the regular expressions or the globs and, and um, the file hashes used for, for the app shop. Um, but yeah, it's really cool to, to see it finally have offline access. That's, that's something people have asked for for a long time. Um, oh, and I, I, sorry, Jody, I forgot to mention also um, something else we've added is we've used the um, window. So with, not within the service worker, but within the app itself, we're using um, the window.online. I think that is what it is. Navigator.online. I think it's moved to window. It's not a navigator anymore. Um, <clears throat> to basically tell the user whether they're online or offline. And we're also with via push messaging, communicating that back to the service worker to tell it when, when we lose connection and when we regain connection, because you can make some decisions in the service worker based on that state is changing. Um, and and we use we show a little notification in, in the uh, UI to tell you, oh, you, you don't have internet connection. Oh, your internet connection is back. Um, also with this uh, background caching that we're gonna do, we also need to do a similar thing, but from the other way. So from our service worker, we need to basically tell the user, hey, by the way, we're, we're caching some pages for you that you'll probably wanna access even if you don't have internet access and um, update them on progress. And once we've finished caching, we can send them a message again, show them a message to say, you can go offline now. The critical pages you probably want to access is off available offline. So that's something I forgot to mention. But we're also building it. Yeah. So so there's there's facilities available for for all of that, um, which which is a very real user need. I think. Um, yeah. Uh, I think you can do the next slide. Couldn't remember what this problem was, but. Sometimes when the user was opening the um, uh, Skulk recognizes this, when, when they tap the, um, the notification, it would open the service worker code itself. No, I can't remember what, what the solution was, but uh, that was a fun one. So this is what our service worker code looks like. Uh, next the slide. crazy thing about that is, is that looks like the service worker even before we've run Webbox, in, uh, Webbox inject because the array in Precache and RAS is empty. Yeah. So it's like something really went badly wrong. It was the, the old plugin we were using. Uh, yeah, there's yeah. probably some some mime type, like setting it to a text file or something, some weirdness happening there. Yeah. Um, next one. So just a couple of things on testing very quickly. Worst article ever. They, they never talk about progressive web apps except for in the title. Next slide. Progressive web apps is hype, man. Exactly. Um, yeah, they, I don't they, know what they, it means, but it gets the people going. <laughs> this, this sums up my feeling about Medium in general. Uh, but Cypress does have a blog post where they've got an interesting, maybe slightly clunky, but a very powerful approach to testing offline access. Like I said earlier, don't tell me something is not testable. There's always a way. Um, so have a look at that. Um, next slide. Uh, thank you very much for listening. It's been uh, a lot of information to share. So thank you for sticking around. Uh, next slide. Of course, we're hiring. Um, if you want to use your skills for, for good, please get in touch. Uh, have a look at openup.org.za slash jobs or just email us. Um, my, our email addresses are at the, at the start. Um, you can also email info at openup.org.za. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and if you don't, don't want to work with us, check out on ZA Tech Slack, um, Tech for Good and CodeBridge Newlands. Yeah, that was really great. I, I really appreciate the fact that you kind of, I think my fear was that it's that it's going to be like, hey, this is how to build a progressive web app talk, and uh, you know, and there's no shortage of those type of things on YouTube. Um, so, like, 
I actually think that you know a lot of the discussion that should be that we should be having about PWA is is kind of of a more meta nature, kind of around um, kind of the usage and and and, and so forth. Um, it's a pity that Justin isn't here. Um, I know he's a very big fan of Jeremy Keith. Um, I know he's also read Jeremy Keith's Going Offline, um, but. I um, I'm I'm also a big fan fan of of Jeremy Keith and I I kind of like his approach that um, like PWA is isn't necessarily a technical issue at the moment like uh, it's more uh, user ex like there's more like questions that need to be answered around user experience and so forth and not not technically um, so I I really appreciate that you guys went quite into that. Um, because the reality is that this is not the way that users expect um, the web to work or even apps to work. Um, so I think there's a lot of like kind of work that still needs to be done in, in, in that world. Um, cool. So um, I myself, as always, have like a million questions, uh, but I obviously want to open up the floor, see if there's anyone here who has any questions. You are welcome to either type them in the text chat or unmute yourself. Ah, this is a really great one. Um, so from uh, Hardis, um, you know, was there a discussion around like doing kind of, for example, a native app or a hybrid app versus a PWA at the beginning? Um, what, what did that conversation kind of look like? Yeah, I think the two main things that went into not going that route uh, the one was that we didn't have the, uh, the experience. Uh, we've done an Android native app before using Cordova or Wrap app or something like that. Um, but um, this was the, the other thing, which, which is a, a couple of things really, is that we, everyone we spoke to were just saying the review process for apps is a pain in the neck. And I'm so used to fixing something, shipping something, fixing something, shipping something, and really, really fast. Not, not as fast as users would like, but um, I am not used to, and I'm not interested in waiting days or weeks for something to get reviewed. And some, the whim of someone um, meaning that something like, we've got the election coming up. If we want to get something out for the election, um, and we've got a few days and that opportunity is missed, like that's tragic. So um, yeah, for, for us, that's kind of where, where the, uh, the decision came in. I, I can attest to that as well. Uh, so I, I think it's exacerbated by the fact that um, you are like specific in the case of some, so like if you're working with Apple, you know, they are basically based in the States so like if you send the email then you only get a reply the next day um, because they only get the email while you're sleeping so there's a massive feedback loop you can essentially just send an email and then only get a response the next day and then you send a new email or you need to phone them at like two o'clock in the morning or whatever um well i don't know how it is nowadays but like that was back uh, when I kind of worked with the team that that kind of did apps and also you know like it's it's, it's costly um, I think it's it's a thousand rand a year um, to have an app on the Apple app store or to have a developer account so yeah um, and I, I think something as well and, and and I think for me personally this is uh, one of my pet peeves is is people thinking that PWAs are a replacement for native apps uh like it, it's not really an either or you know uh uber has a native app and a pwa twitter has a native app and a pwa um uh, yeah even facebook so um yeah like that's kind of like such as oh someone's drawing on the screen <laughs> ah there it's gone <laughs> um yeah like i i, I think like, I, I think, like, for me personally, it's, it's one of those things where there's always that transition where you're kind of moving from a certain kind of paradigm into a new paradigm, and you kind of just emulate prior paradigms. Uh, you know, this is kind of embedded in this concept of a web page itself. 
but you know whether it was from radio to television and and and, and so forth you um yeah and i think we're kind of still in that phase where we aren't really exploring what progressive web apps like provide us like as a thing in itself um that nothing else provides us but we're trying to emulate an existing thing um which to me feels like such a wasted opportunity this, this um, touch is really nice on what what emmanuel is saying uh, what's yeah i just wanted to get to that <laughs> <laughs> sorry yeah. I'll, I'll let you do your hosting sorry <laughs> no, 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 go ahead, please. Uh, uh, so, yeah. so Emmanuel was saying, um, if users can just access the website, uh, what's the point of, um, of a, a PWA? Mm -hmm. And I think the, my answer to that is, what's a PWA? All we have is notifications, um, and we have offline access, and we have, um, um, what was the other one? Add to home screen. So that it's, it's really, it's just functionality. It's a web page with, with some cool functionality or like Skulk said, uh, superpowers. Um, we've got uh, add to home screen because the municipality, the client wants an app. They really want an app. The users we spoke to were kind of um, colored a little bit by, the, um, by the, the municipality speaking to them before we spoke to them. That wasn't the ideal user testing, but... Um, <laughs> Like with user testing, you, you want your users to have a blank slate and not have, well, you want to control the background information because that affects your, your testing. But um, they, um, they knew we were talking about an app. So they were like, yeah, an app would be amazing. So you're, you're talking about an app. But at the end of the day, actually at the home screen is valuable because a lot of people don't know how to use bookmarks on their phone. Uh, they did use bookmarks on Internet Explorer 10 years ago, maybe, or if they use a computer, but their phone might be their main device or their only device now. Um, and how are they going to find the, the website again? What's that website again? But they're used to the concept of apps. So in that way, Add to Home Screen does actually make sense. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, it totally supports SEO. And that's the other way of people finding, finding stuff. So if you don't screw up your um, SEO like we did by literally telling Google not to index you the official yeah. way, <laughs> um, then um, then that's. But yeah, so, like I yeah, think so, so. Those those features just mm -hmm. um, I, I, I personally I don't really see it so much as and and that's why I felt silly. The one of the big reasons we didn't uh, just build PWA functionality into their website is because it's. Drupal or something that I'm not really familiar with and they've got their own processes and it was you know it was simpler just to go let's let's take this user research we're doing let's see what we come up with and then let's figure out the migration plan after that but totally it should be their website that just gets superpowers yeah I think um Emmanuel and um Zutisa I, I think I think PWAs got convoluted into like uh skull Fenter said a while a, bit, a moment ago as a, a replacement for native apps and I, mm. I think we need to rethink that thinking i think a pwa is an evolution of web of the web um it's just it's like when responsive design came in it, it's not you know it, it's nothing any website can do it you know mm but it's a new way of thinking. This is a new way of thinking about what a website can be. Um, and, it, and it starts to blur the line between website and application, web application. Um, and I think we need to think about it more that way. And I think the progressive word in the, in the mm. name is important, is where mm. you're taking your basic website and you're progressively enhancing it with additional capabilities. Mm. Adding it to the home screen, is one of those capabilities that you get. And for people who, who, who are used to using apps, that's just what they expect. That's the user expectation. And that's what you basically play towards is what does the user expect? Well, they expect an app with an icon on their phone that they can tap and it opens the thing up. For them to open a browser, a lot of them don't even know what a browser is. Mm. And then yeah. to oh, have to remember like HTTP, is something app dot I can't remember. Um, it's just making it harder to use this thing that actually could potentially be useful for them. And then from the SEO perspective, it's just a website. 
So everything you can do in terms of SEO for a website, you do for a PWA. You have, kind of have to. You have your meta tags, you have performance, you have accessibility, you have responsiveness. All of these things play, play a role in that. And it is discoverable the exact same way as any other website. Hmm. No, for sure. And, and just also as a, a side note, so uh, like actually nowadays, it doesn't say add uh, add to what home screen anymore. It actually says install the name of your app. So in, in your case, it would, I guess, be install my Muni or, or whatever. Um, so the other thing as well is there's a question around, uh, in your opinion, what are best examples of uh, well-performing PWAs? Uh, I can definitely speak to that. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know if you guys want to kind of uh, respond to that. I am guilty of not using a lot of PWAs and I'm changing that slowly, but certainly I'm starting to use Todoist as a PWA and I find that works really well. Um, and I know a lot of people would really like the Twitter. So, um, the, yeah, like, so I use uh, YouTube uh, music, um, and that is only available as a PWA on desktop. Um, there is, well, there's a kind of a wrapping app, but that is a third party thing. Um, and like, I, I use that, and I'm, I'm actually pretty surprised by how well it works. But you know, um, the other thing as well is you can publish uh, PWAs to, uh, to the Play Store. So there are actually uh, a lot of uh, PWAs that you might not even know you're using. So I know the, the Twitter Lite one is a PWA. Um, there's like kind of a Uber, some like Uber, I almost want to say Uber Lite or something as well. Um, there's, a, there's also most apps have a kind of a a lot of times where you see on Google Play, you see like, oh, there's like Uber and then there's like Uber Lite or whatever, which is kind of like a more lightweight version. That's usually PWA. Um, and, and the reason for that is, um, okay, so let me backtrack a bit. I, I think one of the fields where we're seeing the, the most exciting things happening in the world of PWA is the e-commerce space. Um, specifically because um, in e-commerce, you have this problem where uh, you want an app um, in order to let people know when there are sales and things and, you know, user retention and so forth. But at the same time, you want people to be able to type in Google um, and then actually if they search for I want new shoes or whatever. So you want that. And currently with actual apps, you, you don't get that. Currently, you need a parallel website. Um, What's nice about PWAs is if I were to search for um, shoes or whatever on Google and I click on a link and I have a PWA for that domain or that specific scope installed already, it will open it in the app. Um, so there's some really exciting things happening there um, where like the e-commerce space really benefits from kind of the, 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 the reach of the web uh, and the kind of the integration of uh, what you would generally find with with apps before yeah I also, I also ahead. heard of, um, uh, that somebody today in a video talking about using outlook microsoft outlook's pwa and apparently mm -hmm. it works amazingly well and the thing is if you click a mail to link in a web page it opens the pwa um oh. with the compose and everything so that's, that's really cool i think microsoft is doing I, in general microsoft does pretty amazing stuff these days when it comes to like open web technologies i would really look at their stuff they're doing some mm. great yeah yeah I, I i think like they've especially edge um it's, it's such a pity that so many people um kind of view edge through the lens of internet explorer but edge is a phenomenal browser um like i if I wasn't already so embedded in terms of the Chrome ecosystem, um, in terms of my plugins that I use and so forth, like I, I would definitely use Edge. Um, but someone told me you can actually use Chrome plugins in Edge because it's just Chromium and, and, and so you forth. You totally can. Yeah. It's like Brave. I use mm. Brave these days and I can use all the same plugins. Mm. Mm. No, definitely. Um, yeah, like, so, but I, I think like uh, there, there's definitely a lot of work that still needs to happen in this space. Um, and 
one of it is, as you guys rightfully pointed out, I, I think a lot of this low level logic still needs to be abstracted away. Um, and I think we're trying to figure out like how to do this. Um, I very much see this as similar to kind of what happened within the world of like um, build processes. So things like in the early days of like Grant, Gulp, uh, early Webpack days and so forth. I know that like that was such a pain point for people. And we've kind of reached a point nowadays where so much of that is abstracted away. Um, we don't necessarily think like I have, I'm running loads of projects where I don't even know what the webpack configuration looks like. Um, and, and I think that's essentially kind of where, where PWAs are going to be heading to is, um, and I know um, this is something that capacitor, uh, what's it, capacitator or capacitor um, really pushes. Um, so capacitor is kind of, uh, I think it's by the Ionic team um, and they are kind of aiming to create like a, a almost one ring to bind them all type thing. So you, 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 you can push your code as a PWA, you can push it to Android, you can push it to um, iOS and, 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 and so forth. And, you know, like, I think they are doing a lot of cool work there. Um, Oh, it's just uh, J, JD kind of uh, responding there. Um, yeah, but like, I, I think also one thing we need to remember is that the web moves really slowly. And um, like, I often see this, I, I saw this with web components as well, is when something gets announced, um, like people get really hyped up and everyone's talking about it and everyone's making videos on this new thing, um, web components that's going to kill React and Angular and no one's going to be using JavaScript libraries anymore. Everyone's just going to be using web components. And then there's, it's almost like those, what's it like the five stages of grief or something. Um, I, I don't even know how many stages there are of grief. Um, to me, this is one big one. <laughs> um, and like where you have this initial excitement and then you kind of have this realization that, oh, okay, you know, like it's not necessarily, like it's a bit more limited than you anticipated. And you have this gradual, small, like growth, like uh, like uh, like almost like dripping in of kind of mind share and so forth. And then usually there's like a second uptake. Um, I think we saw this with SVGs as well where SVGs, were, when they were kind of introduced initially, were really lauded as like the future. And then because of browser support and whatever, like people kind of forgot about it a bit. And then one day we just realized, hey, almost all browsers support SVG now. And you, we got like kind of like the second wave of like hype and interest. Yeah, the web is a strange place. It, it moves very slowly and in, in weird ways. Um, but there's, there's definitely still a lot of room for PWAs to grow and to develop. Uh, we are definitely still in the awkward teenager phase where we are between two worlds. Um, I often use this as well when I'm talking about web components. We're kind of in between the world of um, websites and actual building real software in the web. Um, and obviously, you know, kind of that liminal space is, is an awkward space. Um, and messy yeah like no but for sure and then and, and, and I think people judge it too harshly the same with web components in terms of they don't see it as a stepping stone in a specific direction and they see it as kind of like the solution yeah and I think I kind of went through the whole like web standards um, kind of coming from the world of flash and all of that and um, like that, that mess was, was like PWAs and web components is nothing compared to kind of the early days of kind of like the, the web standards and the open web. Um, yeah. Is it possible that we can have a discussion on PWAs without talking about Apple? Mm. <laughs> Not really, no. Yeah. But I alluded to that. Um, uh, earlier, I think um, there's great people there, and Jen Simmons is somebody that I've yeah. worked closely with. She was at Mozilla, and she's now at Apple, and yeah. she's always 
happy to receive tweets. Um, mm. And WebKit has a bug tracker and you can vote. Um, and so I think the evangelism from us as developers is an important thing that's missing from the whole PWA thing, or whatever you want to call it. PWA, uh, progressive web applications, different way of thinking about what a website can be, you know, mm. insert your explanation of what it means. Um, mm. The thing is, if we want these things, we need to build them, use them, and, and evangelize for them, and go to the browser vendors and say, we want you to support this because our users depend on this. Mm. This is good for the web. And they're, mm. they're willing to listen. But the mm. thing is, if, if adoption rates are low, when you have a small team like at Mozilla, like the Firefox developer team, they're small compared to Google and Apple and uh, Microsoft, oh, for example. Definitely. So they need to prioritize. And if they're mm. looking at the industry and they're saying, you know what? On desktop, PWA is, is, is like beating a dead cow. It's, it's, there's no point. They're going to mm. remove those pieces because it opens other areas they can focus on. Mm. So mm. if we want these things, we need to push for them. Mm. And the people are willing and able. Mm. It's just they need a good reason to do it. Mm. Yeah, you actually touch on a very good point. Uh, you know, like uh, you did mention, you know, they, uh, let me actually, I think I have the link here somewhere. Here somewhere. Yeah, I'm going to share it in the chat. So the actual um, discussion thread on them dropping, oops, I actually sent it as a direct message to JD. Um, them, uh, like the actual discussion thread on them dropping support for that. And, and like, I think what I find very encouraging is um, just like the, the the amount of pushback they received um as you did mention you know like this is not necessarily within their control um this is kind of more of a triad situation they've received a lot of pushback on in other areas as well where they said they're not going to kind of support things because of they always make it very clear because of resources um, and they need to kind of be smart in terms of how they're spending their time. But um, I think like what I found encouraging is, is kind of in that thread, you have a lot of people mentioning and, and saying that this is actual functionality that they use on a daily basis. And, you know, like, uh, like don't remove this. Um, but yeah, you know, like uh, Firefox needs to kind of, or oh, Mozilla needs to kind of do what they need to do. I, I, I get that. Um, Apple, like, I don't know, uh, I, I've kind of, I think I've kind of gotten past the point of being diplomatic. Um, like, I, like, I'm willing to just say on record, like, screw Apple. Like, I, like I'm a massive James Simmons fan, uh, uh, like, massive. I, I really followed the work she did at, at Firefox very closely. But I, th I think, unfortunately, the problem there is, once again, it's not a technical problem. It's a managerial problem um they aren't given the resources to actually do things and a lot of people speculate that that is intentionally so um but yeah I, I, like i think apple isn't gonna listen to people uh i'm much more cynical in that regard i think the only way forward is uh legislation and I, I think that's what we're seeing at the moment they're kind of getting sued by a lot of companies um because they don't allow, they have monopolies on their uh, kind of platform. One of them being, as JD pointed out, that all browsers on an iOS device is Safari. It's just with a different skin. If you install Chrome on um, iOS, you're running Safari just with the Chrome GUI on top of it. Same for any other browser. You can only install Safari on iOS and um, yeah, like they are actually facing some antitrust suits and things. And my hope is that eventually there's like kind of some legal breakthrough where they have to concede and allow like other browsers to actually install their rendering engines on iOS. Because um, what's going to happen then is then we're going to start seeing things like this site is best viewed on Chrome or whatever, um, which is probably something they don't want. Uh, but, you know, like that's the only reason why we're not seeing that yet is because like people on Apple don't have a choice. They need to run Safari. Um, cool. There's some other discussions. Yeah. 
yeah exactly like Harris said as well you know the antitrust um, so I, I know there was one recently I think it was by Epic Games um, and they Apple actually ended up winning but from a public relations but the consensus is that from a public relations perspective like it was even if they won it was really damaging to them um yeah so I, like for me personally I, I see that as the only road forward um because they've made it clear yeah. that they don't really care um yeah they are going to allow more payment providers which is already a win yeah so you know like incrementally and and essentially i think like that they are holding back kind of they are the kind of the, the 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 damn wall that's holding back like pwas at this point because you know like if you can't reliably say that these features will be supported on all devices that's already that's already tough you know that already makes for a tough sell um but like for me personally so um uh, Skulk, you did mention, um, you know, like it is a bit tricky getting uh, PWAs on the Play Store. So, uh, like, fair enough, it is it is pretty new and I, I, I dare I say bleeding edge at the moment. But so Microsoft and Google is uh, collaborating on something called PWA Builder, which is essentially, I've actually tried it out and it's really cool. Like you literally just pointed at a PWA and it creates an APK for you. It is really, really cool. Um, uh, but it's still early days, uh, like the documentation is the massive gaps in the documentation. But um, yeah, to be honest, if the very least that I can do is just use HTML and CSS and JavaScript to have an app on Google Play um, without having to learn Kotlin or whatever, even if that's all that kind of the PWA ecosystem allows me, like to me, that's a massive win already. Um, so yeah, like it's 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 interesting times. Um, but yeah, we're getting there bit by bit. No, uh, uh, people are posting things here in the chat that are going to roll me up on Apple. Like I'm going to say some things on record in a video, in a recorded video that I'm going to regret. Ah, yeah, you guys don't even want to get me started. <laughs> um cool any any other questions um one thing that, yeah. that that just came to mind from from my side is um i mentioned we're building this for something like thirty six thousand, maybe now forty thousand users uh, hmm. in that municipality obviously we want to make this uh white labeled so that it can be applied in other municipalities as well hmm. um and that's an interesting thing where i think some of the stuff I can't, I haven't looked very deeply, but it, what worried me a bit about that was that some of the uh, manifest stuff isn't completely client side controlled. So um, if you want to re respond with a different manifest with different colors, different uh, logos and things like that, or logo URLs for uh, different apps for different clients, um, then we're probably talking server side serving some of these static assets. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Client can still uh, cache them, but um, it, it gets a little bit more complex. Maybe not a common use case, but, uh, but it's worth, worth keeping in mind that, that some of these things are, um, mm. yeah. Yeah, so, so, so you're talking about just like manifest uh, JSON in general. Yeah. yeah, like here's the thing: you can actually deliver that via an API, um, uh, actually, because effectively it doesn't. E people talk about manifest.json; it doesn't even need to be a JSON file, um, as long as the MIME type is correct. Like, you can put it in anything. Um, you can like put it in a PNG if you want and just set the MIME time correctly. The extension doesn't matter at all, which effectively means you can put it in an actual API call as well. Uh, can it be on a different domain? You can, you, you can, you, uh, no, for obvious reasons. Um, but what you can do is you obviously know that you can scope it accordingly. Um, so you can have it maybe tied to subdomains. Um, 
yeah, if it can be on a, on a subdomain, that's fine because you could have API mm. dot whatever and then exactly. app yeah. dot whatever or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say, oh, I think one thing that I also like for me has been like a like a kind of a big insight is that you know like i i was i forgot that you know like we like this is kind of like a recurring cycle um and in the same way that we are very accustomed now to this idea of kind of uh, web apps as replacement for software uh, i usually talk about you know like five years ago ten years ago trailer would be something that you would buy on a DVD in Incredible Connection and install on your computer. Um, and that's also been quite a journey. You know, like we definitely, for a long time, like web apps have been seen as inferior to actual things that you install via installation wizard. And, you know, and, and we've kind of been, people have been coming around on that like for the past couple of years as well, you know, um, I think talking about Figma, you know, uh, like the market share of Figma is just absolutely insane. I'd, I'd say that compared to things like Photoshop and so forth, uh, Figma is actually a superior product. Um, and I think that has for me kind of very much shown that like, you know, this assumption that like, things that you build in the web are compromised in some regard to actual OS level software that you install is, is kind of like false actually. Um, and I, I, I guess we're going to start seeing the same with PWAs as well eventually. In like, I think it's going to take a long time, but at this point, um, because like what are people's frame of reference? You know, when they think about websites, I think about WordPress. Um, they think about like some janky drop down menu that's written with like a, a, a jQuery version from 2003 um, that breaks when you click it and takes forever to load. And um, unfortunately, I think like that's kind of just the parent, that's kind of the perception that we need to kind of like change. Um, and um, as much as like it's a, it's a hassle that you need to say allow push notifications or deny push notifications, I think like at the very least um, that is not something that 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 users are going to immediately discount because they're going to get a million messages from like spam websites or whatever. Uh, just because these permissions are so stringent. So I actually see that as a good thing. I'm, but I'm, yeah. I'm triggered now. I'm doubly, doubly triggered. Um, but no, I, I was thinking back to so, what someone else was saying about like what, what progressive web apps we've seen that we think are, are really good examples. And to mm. be honest, yeah, like, I also don't use a, a lot, but after this experience, I've been looking at native apps and going, I know how to build this. I know how to build this. Like it would, it, this, the app we built doesn't have the polish of a lot of the, the apps that I use, um, but mm. uh, I know I can get there. Um, mm. And I already have the whole stack um, mm. versus if I was going to, to build native apps, I would have to learn so much to, to get there. It, it isn't as powerful you don't have full control like i think i couldn't get at least on my my um samsung i couldn't get um notifications to vibrate a lot mm. of that stuff is is disabled by default you can go into the mm. menu and, and enable it like there's mm. there's a lot of stuff that you don't have the full control over but there's mm. also just a lot of the interactivity stuff that you could totally build just a slick uis like you're talking about figma um, hmm. in, in native apps, oh, hmm. sorry, in, in, um, in, hmm. in PWAs and hmm. pretty much no one would be the wiser. Hmm. I think some, something that, that is a bugbear for me is that people still build things like drop downs themselves. And hmm. there's a exactly. lot of work. If you think about a drop down that someone uses in a native app, they're not hmm. building that thing from scratch. Hmm. They're, they're pulling in a drop down from some library, some component library. So mm. 
there's there's so many subtle things that go into handling like hover states and uh tap and hold and hmm. there's there's so much more than you can imagine that goes into an interactive component don't hmm. bloody build interactive components if you can find one in a component library and hmm. if you really want to have something special look for a component library that composes well that you could hmm. extend um rather than be or go through that whole list of all the uh, affordances that go into that mm. interactive component. Uh, that's, that's what building slick interactive UIs is mm. about. Mm. Um, don't, don't build these things from scratch. Yeah, yeah and, and, and of course, if, if uh, the thing you need is already in HTML, just use that. This is a Mozilla guy's talking. <laughs> especially if you're running Firefox. <laughs> um, but no, like 100% agree. And I, I, my hope is that that is the space that we're going to start moving into bit by bit with web components. Um, the, interestingly enough, um, one of the real good use cases of web components nowadays with, with something like Stencil is actually um, interop between different JavaScript libraries. Um, because the, like the, the web component API is also similar to kind of like the APIs that we use with JavaScript libraries. Um, in Stencil, for something like Stencil, you can create a web component. And then if you have, you can use it in, in Angular, in React, and, and whatever, uh, you can use it in any. Because at the end of the day, it's, it, it's just HTML. It's just an HTML tag. Um, so that's where I see that is, 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 is really going to like kind of like play out. But I think it's also worth noting. Let me just see. I think there's another question. Oh, it's a skulk uh, sharing things. Um, but I think also like we need to also be like upfront about the fact that I, I, I think performance wise, um you're never going to be able to compete with an app that is written in like swift or written in kotlin and so forth and it's just because you can make so many assumptions about the environment that it's going to run in um but on the flip side because the web doesn't give you like because the web doesn't know where it's going to run in, like you have almost near universal reach, like whether you're accessing it from a smart fridge or, or whatever. Um, so like there's there's kind of a trade-off there. Like it, it's not, I think if you just look at both of these things in a vacuum, like I guess native apps are generally always gonna kind of be a better experience. But, you know, like if you, if you, that's a slippery slope because if you follow that logic, then why not just write everything in plain like machine assembly? You know, like that's going to be the best experience ever. Um, you know, so obviously the closer you get to the metal, um, the the more expensive it becomes to maintain things. Like uh, the limited, it, like the cases are where you can actually publish that and so forth. And I, I think also something we oftentimes forget is that a lot of apps don't have universal reach. Um, I think we as developers since we tend to have pretty high end phones um we are pretty like we don't realize that there are a lot of devices where you can't like install certain apps on uh i remember back when i was still a visual artist and i was i didn't have a lot, a lot of money like the phone that i had at that point i couldn't install the trello app on um, you know, and, and like the thing is, and this is where the progressive part really comes in. Like I, I was just out of luck. I couldn't use Trello, um, because obviously the, the, um, the, the web version wasn't as fleshed out yet back then. Um, and this is what's nice about the progressive part. Like you, you kind of, or you're sure that your users are going to be able to get some form of your product, um, with with apps in the in the app store and so forth it's usually a dichotomy of yes no you can install this app you can't um and i think that once again that is something that's the reason why um companies like uber and twitter and so forth have pwas in addition to native apps 
because at, with native apps, at some point you need to say, okay, we're not going to be supporting these devices. Um, and with PWAs, then you have that fallback. And I think Uber has a really great article that they wrote about kind of like their thought process around the PWA that they created. And it's very interesting. They, they, I think they created it specifically for emerging markets. So for countries in Africa and, and, and so forth, where you had a lot of like entry level smartphones and, and, and so forth. Um, it's a really great read. I'll, I'll see if I can find it. Um, but yeah, I think that that's all from my side, finally. <laughs> but it's just like, I, I just find the space so interesting. And like, yeah, I can't, I can't help but think aloud. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, JD. Thanks so much, Skulk. Um, this is really great. I, I think we don't hear quite enough about kind of all the things around the actual process of building a PWA and so forth. Um, there was a lot of super insightful things for myself here as well. And then we'll see all of you hopefully next month again. Um, cool. JD, uh, Scott, can I maybe just ask that you guys share some of these resources and maybe links to the slide on the meetup page as well? Um, sure, there's some you. great stuff here. Cool. All right. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Cheers. Bye.